This is a geek leader. Hey guys, John Rauta back again with episode 47 of A Geek Leader, and today we have Jim Holmes with us. Jim Holmes uh, writes over at frazzledad.com. It's his blog. Uh, he's a well-known conference speaker on all things technical. Um, lately, mostly been fo- focusing around uh, quality assurance. Jim is a veteran. He uh, was in the Air Force for a while and got out of the Air Force and went into a bunch of IT-type jobs from time to time. And uh, he wrote a book called The Leadership Journey, which is all about the process of becoming a technical leader and how to build those skills that are needed um, when you transition from a technical role to a leadership role. One thing I love about this book is it is extremely practical. Um, A lot of leadership books are kind of in that niche of being um, more theoretical, more psychological, but this is a very practical guide that has... um, lots of little step-by-step practical things that you can do that you need to be doing. It's got worksheets. It's got uh, lots of good stuff. So I'm going to link that up in the show notes. But I hope you guys really enjoy this conversation that I had with Jim Holmes. All right, and we're live. I have Jim Holmes with me today. He's the author of uh, The Leadership Journey, and he blogs at Frazzled Dad. Uh, and you can check him out. I've got links in the show notes at geekleader.com. And uh, Jim, if you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and about how you got started in the uh, technology realm. Sure. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, So I've had a rather eclectic uh, psycho career. Um, Been a tomato farmer, wine salesman, um, spent 11 years in the Air Force straight out of high school. I didn't go to college. Um, I got my degree through night school. Um, But... All the way even back to being like a little kid, I was always interested in technology, Um, you know, forever taking apart stuff, sometimes could get it back together in working order. Uh, When I was in high school, a friend had an old Radio Shack Trash 80 that started to do some uh, software development on, mostly trying to figure out if we could uh, write programs that would help us play in Dungeons & Dragons, like, (laughs) you know, figuring out catapults for not even like the practical stuff, right? It wasn't even like easy stuff of, hey, can we roll dice? It's like, no, let's figure out if we can write a program that'll tell us whether or not a catapult will break down a wall. Um, I uh, went in the Air Force. I ran radar and interrogation systems on uh, big surveillance plane um, and then started up into night school for management information systems. So it was doing... A little bit of software development, learning some programming fundamentals. Um, Got out of the Air Force, got married, uh, really followed my wife around the world for her Air Force career, and just kept falling into interesting technical jobs. Um, Did some wide area networking, did server management, just continued on kind of staying in whatever technical job I could find where if she got posted. Um, and that just kind of led on to this very interesting career path of some software development, some program management, some customer relations, um, and really spent a lot of time in kind of quality oriented things, both formal testing, but then just kind of the higher level quality, both on the business side, on the delivery side. Um, So it's just been this kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a couple of cups of coffee and I thought I was through all of my frog throat. <laughs> That's all right. So I want to ask you a little bit about, I want to go way back. You, you mentioned tomato farmer and wine salesman. So did you compete with Gary Vaynerchuk on the wine? I don't know Gary. You don't know Gary. Okay. He's a, um, he owns a, a winelibrary.com. Uh, he was one of the. Oh. I think one of the first two uh, e-commerce sites out there. Uh. No, so my wine days were actually before um, uh, before e-commerce. Uh, yeah, he was in the nineties. So. Long time ago, and I was yeah, I was working in a brick and mortar spot, um, and I was working eight hours a day there, uh, making less money than my second job, which was like two or three hours a day doing 
uh, PC maintenance for an oil <laughs> company. Uh, so the pay wasn't great, but the homework was fantastic. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, so you were doing all these different tech jobs, and it sounds like you had like a wide variety um, from infrastructure to uh, what sounds like maybe DevOps before DevOps existed, um, t- uh, to QA and uh, service delivery and that kind of thing. How do you think all of those things put together kind of made you uh, get into the position you are today? Man, so um, I am a big – let me see. The diversity and breadth of that experience um, mm-hmm. has been a huge help to me. Um, and it was kind of foisted on me because – yeah, people had asked me, what's your five-year plan? I have no freaking idea. Um, because literally, I mean, I had to follow my wife around for her Air Force career, right? So it was getting to some place and then finding out what was available that sounded interesting that, you know, could keep me employed. Um, it, and I didn't mind that lack of control because there were just really interesting opportunities. And, and I think that breadth has really helped me um, – look at software delivery from a very different aspect. Uh, I tend to be much more business and customer oriented than most, you know, just hardcore geeks, if you will. No, uh, I, I'm the same way. Um, a lot of people don't know this about me, but my career started out in PC tech and then database administration. And then I, I somehow got roped into teaching full time for a while. <laughs> so I, I taught for, um, and I still teach part time at, at Winthrop, um, university, but, uh, and then it got into software on the software mm-hmm. side of things. And, and I, I think having the diversity kind of lets you see things from different perspectives that maybe if you're just an engineer and that's all you've done your whole life, it's harder to see things from you know the user's perspective. But being the guy that has to go in there and fix the software when it goes wrong, it makes me think more about the quality of what you're building from a development standpoint. Yeah, you know, and you mentioned having that PC background. Um, I think, it, you know, if you get on somebody who's only been like that coder gal or that, you know, the web services guy, um, they start throwing together solutions and it's like, well, how are we going to deploy this? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what the, you know, that's magic. No, it is magic. Um, it, I just, I can't emphasize enough in retrospect, how, how I found that breadth of experience to be a huge advantage. Um, and I've had people ask me for career advice, you know, well, I want to specialize in this, and do I need to worry about you know, doing these other things? Technology change, I mean, what release of jQuery are, are we on? You know, it's like, uh, well, it's 10 o'clock. They've released four versions <laughs> since nine. Um, you know, so you can overly focus on the details of the stuff or you can step back and kind of take a bigger holistic view. Um, and it's not that those details aren't important, right? But I think, I think it just brings a whole lot more value when you've got that broader experience. Cause I can go find people that know the details, right? Um, and, and those folks are awesome, but yeah, I'm beating a dead horse here, but it, um, that broader experience helps me in so many ways so many ways no i think you're absolutely right i think that helps a lot too when it comes to um leadership in general when when you think about um the fact that a lot of times as a leader you're you're you you have multiple hats you have to wear you have to be able to communicate very well with your engineers you have to be able to communicate with the business and being a a liaison basically or or what i like to call a translator to translate some of that uh, communication that's going on and being able to see things from the perspective, from your background that you've had, uh, um, probably helps you a whole lot in that, that those conversations. It does, um, you know, and I have a very different view given my 11 years in the military, and not just being in the military, but actually being an air crew member, um, flying on planes, and you know, trying to make sure that people don't die. Um, Mm -hmm. either through accident or, you know, because that's what the mission was. So it, it helps me to kind of stay calm in the face of a storm, if you will, and and try to help people understand that, no, you don't need an answer for this in five minutes. Let's take a step back. Nobody's life is on the risk. We're not, 
I mean, I ran a data center uh, wide area network in Europe that if the links were down, we were losing tens of thousands of dollars a minute. Um, so again, that broader experience sort of helps me, wait a minute, is this really important or can we take a step back and actually think about a solid fix or solid solution versus kind of half-assing something together to to get the system back up so that we, you know, nobody's life is on the line or um, we aren't losing, you know, tens of thousand dollars per minute because of a service outage. Um, people care about what they do, which is awesome, um, but sometimes we are a little stovepiped and disconnected from reality and lose sense of, you know, what that real time priority is. Um, oh my God, we do have to get this fixed. No, wait a minute. No, we don't. You know, let's talk this over and make sure we understand it and we'll get you something better in another day and the world's not going to end. Right. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's one thing I've noticed. Um, so my, my current role is uh, IT director. So before I was management over software development, now I kind of have the help desk as well as applications and other groups. And it's one of those things where so many people in the support world are trained to, you solve the problem immediately, you fix it immediately. And I've had to step in there a lot of times and say, hold on a second, what's the real problem if we don't fix it immediately? We gotta think, we gotta ask that question. What if we don't? And if it's, oh, it can wait till tomorrow, then maybe it should wait till tomorrow so we can come up with that right solution and not the right now solution. Um, you know, um, so I've, I've worked help desk as well uh, in that odd career. Um, I've done telephone support. I've been a uh, help desk guy. Um, so many delivery teams have zero interaction with those help desk folks, and they don't understand the impacts of um, their um, of their decisions, and they also don't understand, you know, as developers or delivery people, we're rarely on the front line of the wrath of the customers when we get it wrong. But you go sit inside that support group's uh, office for a day or two, I guarantee you'll have a different view on how you deliver software. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And um, when I first took this job, after about two weeks, I decided, oh, I need to learn more about this. And I actually they had an empty <laughs> cube over in their area, and we call it the bullpen. I went and set that bullpen, and I just listened and uh, you know tried to learn a little bit about it. And My uh, God, watched that's the tickets come in. Yeah, because it's, it's not something that I had experienced. Um, you know, from that there standpoint, was, there was a product company I worked for years ago. And when I first got there, um, all of the delivery team was basically remote. But um, the support team, the help desk folks, uh, both for services and then just regular product support, were all in the same room at the corporate headquarters. Um, and this company had severe uh, quality issues like we do a major release, it would literally crater our customers, and then a week later we'd follow up with a service pack. Um, and the first time I was at the uh, at the headquarters, like some of the other devs on the delivery team were like, oh, no, stay away from support, they don't want to talk to you, because they hated, hated the delivery folks, and rightfully so. Um, and we, so we got that repaired, right, but I guess my point there was I had no idea the problems we were causing another group within the organization because of the half-assed way that we were delivering our software. Um, tremendously eye-opening. And, and we managed to build some bridges there and turn that into a, a positive relationship over the course of a couple of years. I mean, a whole bunch of fixes there, right? But again, um, as a delivery team... If you aren't involved with support, um, you're not doing yourself justice, and you're absolutely not doing your users or your customers justice. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, so, how is it as a as I'm going to transition a little bit here as a leader? How do you get your team to understand the impact that they have on these other groups and within the company? Um, what is the best method? Is it just making them sit and you know, take a field trip, as I call it, into those areas for a little bit? Or 
Um, what, what is your take? Um, if you're causing somebody pain, you need to feel that pain, right? Um, so take a field trip, man. That is an awesome phrase. That's an. I'm gonna. I'm totally gonna use that with attribution. Yeah, steal, um, steal it, steal it. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the idea, right? So, uh, in the case of that one company, uh, we started getting service more involved in like um, the bug fixing process. So prioritization, triage. We got them involved, uh, just so more communication with them, right? And as uncomfortable as it was, um, I'd try to spend more time in their office, um, partially to get some of the uh, some of the sense of you know how bad things were, but also to just build relationships with them. So the folks I was working with saw them as humans; they saw us as humans. Um, I'm also a big fan of getting people from the delivery team directly involved in support. So me too, it, you know, um, handling being on the call, right? Um, customer calls up, oh, hang on a second, I'm going to bring a developer in, or you know. So, however that looks, there are a bunch of different ways to handle that. You could actually put, you know, have somebody rotating through. Um, for level two support, somebody from the delivery team, right? So it's your week. Your priority is not user stories or bugs or whatever, right? Your priority is when somebody from support needs help, they call you right away, and that's your main job, right? So yep. that's one good piece there. We did that um, at our last at our last company, and it was great. We we had uh, basically you knew one week out of the probably uh, every five months or so you were going to be on support. And uh, you were level two support, um, you know, in conjunction with the other with, with other groups. But you saw right. all the tickets that came in that level two. And a lot of times it was eye opening. They'll say, wow, you know, we always thought this was just a end user issue. But now that we're getting so many tickets, I see that we can easily, you know, <laughs> it's a UI issue. <laughs> you know, it's, it is, right? Uh, <clears throat> it, and unless you're involved, they're in the trenches, feeling the pain of the customers, feeling the pain of your support. Um you just you miss perhaps the best opportunity to get real feedback on your product. Mm -hmm. It's like holy crap! I had no idea anybody would ever use our API that way because it's APIs and people are going to use them in all kinds of psycho ways, right? Right. Um, usability options or um, one of the best things we ended up finding back through better um, support handling was. How our installation documentation sucked. Um, it's like God, you keep getting the same thing. Let us know that. What, I, you know, two days worth of work on a fac or fixing this part of the install docs, and we just cut your support ticket load by blah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but so, a lot of times that what you're talking about, you know, if if the support manager just told you guys that, it wouldn't make as big of an impact as if you felt it, if you heard it absolutely. from the customer directly. Absolutely right, because we did have that regular interaction um, of the manager to manager, right? But by getting people from the delivery team, and I say delivery team because we had devs going through it, PMs, uh, me and my testers for that particular organization, and then for another product company, right? Um, uh, that being in the trenches, um, there's no experience like that. There's no experience like it. It is so valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, every time that I've done this um, with my various teams, there's always a lot of griping and, oh, I just want to develop, I just want to do this. And so, you know, some people you have to force, some people are, it's a bell curve like humanity, right? Some people are just going to dive in wholeheartedly. Some people will go if you kind of like push them over the cliff, and then others are just going to be screaming the whole way. Um, but taking that step and just making it not optional, you know, it's just um, that this is not punishment. Rather, this is how we're going to work because we're improving our product by everybody understanding how we are killing support 
and how we're doing a disservice to our country, um, yeah, is so, so valuable. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right when it comes to, um, you know, getting people to, to understand. Because I've had de- developers, honestly, when we rolled out Scrum, they didn't want to be part of stand-up because they said, oh, I just want to do code. I don't, <laughs> you know, and uh, we, we've yeah. had, you know, that, that mindset is there. But I think it's, it's part of letting them know that if you want to do really good code, then you have to get the feedback. You know, it's, otherwise you're just doing mediocre code. You have to get out. I mean, so I've harped on this for years that um, the communication issue that we on the IT side of house fully own half of is, you know, oh, developers, you just put them back in the back room, close the door, throw pizza and soda under the door, mm-hmm. um, and they'll magically deliver stuff. And the, what you magically deliver is crap. Um and business doesn't want to talk to the geeks in the back room. The grumpy geeks in the back room don't want to talk to the suits. Um, that's a wall that has to get broken down. And, um, you know, those people who say, oh, I just don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to code. Um, you know, it's it takes a bit of challenge to mm. work with those folks to make them understand why it's important. And, you know, it can go back to just rework metrics you know look you keep we keep missing this one particular feature because we you and me are not going and talking to the product owner or the users and we've had to rework this one damn feature four times uh, you know you've you've now spent 400 percent of your time what you told me it was going to take um and you know some people will get that some people won't and that's okay um you know my i if somebody keeps resisting that and doesn't understand, it's time to say, okay, um, we're just not a good fit for each other, and you can go find another spot in the same organization, or you should just go find a place that will let you just sit in that back room because that's not that's not how software ever should have been done, and it's it's definitely not how we should be doing it in 2018. Right. Yeah, d- definitely. So I want to talk a little bit about your book. Um, I finished it up. I, I, I got that from a recommendation of uh, David Neal, who was on the show um, before, um, called The Leadership Journey, Practical Tips on Starting or Changing Your Leadership Journey. And uh, tell me a little bit about how or why you decided you wanted to put this together. Um, so first off, thanks to David. He's, he's been a great friend for many years. Um, I'm, I'm Gratefully, he mentioned it. So, God, I don't even remember when it was. This was probably about 10 years ago. I wrote a series of blog posts on my blog at frazzledad.com called Leadership 101. Um, and it was just very – each article was about one particular thing, you know, staying calm when stuff's falling apart, um, you know, uh, praising in public, criticizing in private. Um, very kind of tactical things that have been a huge help to me. Um, And, you know, from the five people that read my blog, I got some really (laughs) nice feedback from it. Um, So fast forward a couple years, um, I used to be involved with Codemash Conference, which is this crazy conference at an indoor water park on the shores of Lake Erie um, in January. Uh, And uh, the guy running the conference asked me to put on a leadership workshop because um, I'd been talking about leadership off and on for a number of years. So um, I said, sure. And I had two weeks to put together a workshop. But it was all on fundamentals that, I, that I'd done. So I wasn't worried about that two, that, about the two-week period. But as I'm starting to put everything together, it's like, man, you know, I bet – I could easily take this and turn it into an ebook on LeanPub. So just take kind of the exercises that I'm putting together for the workshop, um, some of my other thinking, and build a book out of it. Um, and so I did. Um, and then through a lot of hard work and dedication and huge procrastination, about two and a half years later, I finally finished it up. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's how the book came about. It was you know kind of from this. A lot of thinking about leadership, writing a blog series, doing some speaking, then this workshop, and then the the book just kind of wrapped up all of that content. 
So I read th- I read, read your book, and um, the thing I like I've read a lot of leadership books. I have an Audible subscription, and that's uh, uh, I've talked about it a little bit. That's one thing I do in my car is I listen to <laughs> to books. And I remember there was one year when I was really struggling with I, when I became a new manager. And you, I don't know if you've went through this process before, but what they did with me is they they said, okay, you're um, you're a good developer. We're going to make you manage people, and. Um, <laughs> That was like the worst thing they could have done because I didn't know what I was doing, and I had a lot of people quit, and I had the highest turnover rate in the company, including our call center for a period of time, which was wow. pretty bad. So, uh, and at that point, I kept telling people, "Oh, that's because you know, in Charlotte, I was right just south of Charlotte, North Carolina." I was like, "Well, in Charlotte, the banks are there, and the people make a lot more money, so they're just leaving for that reason." And after, I remember one time I had two people quit the exact same day, and uh, I went to my mentor. I just gotten a mentor, and I didn't know much about leadership and i just said yeah i had two people quit and I, i'm guessing it's, it's just the salaries they didn't give me a reason he's like don't you think it's probably you i was like oh that hurt <laughs> but uh the, the more i got, so i went to google like all tech techie should do and search why do people quit their jobs and the number one thing came up was their boss i'm like oh god he's right you know so i started consuming these books and just re- and listening to so many of them and um they all had good advice but most of them are very uh high level they're very um you know, theoretical in nature. Mm-hmm. And what I really liked about your book is you had, you had the exercises, you had very practical things that you should be doing. Um, like, like when you talk about uh, conversations and one-on-ones, here are some practical things that you should be doing. Here are some meetings you should be having with, with people on your team. Um, and, and it was, it was, uh, it was really good. You, you had some of the questions that people don't ask. People just assume that you want to be a boss and you want to be a leader. And you actually asked the question, Hey, you know, <laughs> decide if you indeed want to be a leader, you know? Um, so I really like that part, those parts of the book. Um, well, thanks. I, I'm glad you found that useful. Um, you know, your story of, uh, your journey to becoming a leader is sadly, um, far too common and not just in IT, right? Um, you know, we do a bad job um, about bringing people into jobs in the U.S. Um, with no apprenticeship, with no um, kind of good training and mentoring. Like you said, you know, you finally got a mentor, right? What the hell's the finally? <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> it took me two uh, years. <laughs> two years of being a manager before a mentor even showed up. Yeah, you know. <laughs> And so, first off, um, I'm sorry for that pain. Thank you for sharing it, though, right? Because people will not talk about that, right? But that's a very common thing of, oh, you know, you're a good developer. You must be magically a good manager. Here, go run people. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I guess that blog series and then, you know, the workshop and then the book – you know, thank you for recognizing that it is practical because what I was trying to do was help people avoid that kind of situation. Um, I was very fortunate in the military that um, the military overall, every branch in the in the U.S., um, and I can speak specifically to the Air Force because that's where I was. Um, they focus on leadership training because that's how you've got to be at the end of the day, how you got to be mission effective. You have to know how to lead people. Right. And so there's varying degrees and, you know, you can argue the efficacy of it, but the point being um, like two years into my enlistment, I'd been through one week long training session already. And this is like as a 19 year old chucklehead or 20 year old chucklehead. Um, by the time I left the military 11 years later, as a mid-level non-commissioned officer, I'd been through three different leadership schools. Um, and some of that was, you know, about military stuff in general, about, you know, yeah, just military stuff. But a lot of it was dealing with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I get out into the civilian world, I'm like, holy cow, how did you become a boss of anybody? You know, do you not know these fundamental things? No, actually, I don't. (laughs) Um, So, 
those practical exercises and some of those very tactical things that I share in the book come from that, you know, just the idea of, well, you know, we don't have a handbook on how to do this stuff and nobody's talking to people and, you know, what does a one-on-one meeting look like? Why should I be meeting with my team? I tell them what to do. Um, and I think that, another problem that happens yeah. uh, in software development, uh, especially, so at, at least that's where I've seen it, is the fact that we become the bosses that we had and so many people didn't have these things. So like I never was in a one-on-one until I gave a one-on-one, you know, and th- that's because I didn't have bosses that, that did one-on-ones. We did team meetings and we did stand-ups, and you know, that was our meetings. We never had that. The only time I ever did a one-on-one, I take that back. I did have times and that was during the annual performance reviews. That was our one-on-one <laughs> time, you know? Yeah. And sure. so when I became a boss, I thought that was the way you did it because that's what I had seen. And, um, you know, when I read your book, it, I thought back to so many things like, yes, I figured that out, and I wish that I someone had told me that you know, my first six months of being a manager, or before I became a manager even, to right. decide if it's something that I was good at or, or wanted to do. And quite frankly, if I knew all this stuff coming into it, I may, maybe I wouldn't have got into leadership and management. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but you would have been able to make a better, more informed choice, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Um, and at a bare minimum – uh, you know, you would have saved yourself a lot of pain and your company, had they appropriately mentored you and gotten you into that role, they would have saved all that turnover yeah. or at least a good portion of that turnover, right? Because then it might have been, honestly, the salary rather than you having been let down. I mean, let's be clear here. This wasn't your failure. This was a failure of the system that dropped you in that role with no support, right? Um, and, you know, it's interesting that particularly in tech roles, we'll think about, oh, I got to learn, you know, I got to go learn Cowbell 4.0 and I got to learn the latest version of React that dropped. And But we don't think about the soft skills in the human side because, again, oh, we're just developers and we'll be back in that dark room and don't talk to me, right? Um <clears throat> Surprise, we're humans. You need to learn communication. You need to learn how to interact well with others because it helps you at your job. And then, by the way, if you do step into that management or leadership or whatever role, you're better prepared for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, it's one thing that I think, I think my company, you know, where I was at before was moving in that direction because – I say the first two years that I was a manager, we had no form, no formal leadership training whatsoever, and no way to get it unless you went out on your own. And uh, they did start implementing leadership training. Uh, it was very basic, and when they implemented it, they only implemented it to managers. You know, and mm-hmm. I, I kind of felt like I wish the people under me were in, le- in, in leadership training too, because le- leadership isn't just for managers. Right. It's, it's for it's for anybody that <laughs> that needs to lead other people, which which we all do. And you know, even if it's not a leadership thing, right? So air quotes there. Mm-hmm. Um, those skills just make you a better team member, right? Because if, if you've got a better handle on those skills as a team member, you can also understand how to give your leaders better feedback. You understand better um, how to be effective as part of that team. Um, it, it, and again, the military, like, so two years in, I had two stripes as an enlisted guy. Who was I leading? I wasn't leading anybody but was getting those fundamentals in place um, and it just continued on. So, uh, yeah, you know, I wish more companies invested the time in their people across the spectrum there, Mm -hmm. across the spectrum. I I think a big part of it, um, at least for me at the time, it it was hard to show ROI for leadership training. It it wasn't like a a skill you (laughs) would just drop on. You know your resume. Anybody could write that they're a leader, but um, I think what what I started doing, and, and I learned this in actually one of my uh, one of the books that I read. I can't remember which one, but I, I learned to take the things that um, show that we had leadership, or, or that leadership was making a difference, and um, put those skills 
out in, out in front. So I, I, I regularly talked about the fact that I didn't have turnover this quarter, you know, or didn't have turnover this year. And oh. I regularly talked about the fact that um, my team started to do um, team builders. So we started to do uh, one hour a quarter volunteering together. Um, we, we started doing things like that. And I started promoting that you know, outside of, of my company. And then I noticed other teams started doing that. And it's kind of one of those things where, oh, well, let's see who, you know, which manager can have the least turnover for this year, you know. And it, right. It and those are all products of leadership. They weren't products of, of anything else. That's a really good way to think about that. You know, one one thing I, um, for individuals and and leaders, I always think it's important to trumpet your wins. And I don't mean that from a narcissistic or egotistical point, right? But um, life sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and life is hard, right? So when you get something right, spread the joy, spread the love. And it's not about bragging, look how awesome I am. But the fact that you went from having the highest turnover to zero turnover mm-hmm. You think anybody else in the company might be interested in how you did that? <laughs> you know, that's extraordinary, right? So when you can say, man, look at what we did um, by promoting that and, you know, sharing that things went right, you're kind of emphasizing to everybody, man, you know what? Not only did we not suck this week, we actually did some really good stuff. And then other people start to think of, man, you know, how do I get in on that? What's going right there? Because we got something that's a little similar. It's not the same, but, you know, maybe I can use some ideas. Um, it, and it's not this thing that comes from promoting yourself. You know, for some people it is. But again, hello, humans. Um, but rather, to me, it is spread the love, spread the joy. You know, somebody else may be able to pick up on that. Yeah, I think, and and honestly, what you just said, spread the love so someone else can pick up on it. That makes you feel better than touting your own wins for your own personal, you know. To, oh, to, God. Whenever you hear someone yeah. else say, oh, I did what you what you were doing, and I got this same success, that makes you feel so much better than just the, the other way around. It, it absolutely, I mean, so me personally, when I hear, that's the best feedback I can get, right? Um, hey, I took an idea you had. Uh, didn't exactly fit, but it inspired me to try X. I'm like, holy crap, you know, wow, I can, you know, now I, uh, yes, that's great that I helped you and I learned something else from how you tweaked and, um, yeah, I'm with you on that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's some of the best feeling when you get that kind of feedback. You know, hey, your idea helped me, blah. Yeah, and you had another section in your book that I, that I really liked. It was the uh, dealing with the imposter syndrome. And uh, I know I struggle with this, and I've talked about this uh, publicly, you know, several times. Um, for me, it was always I was, and I still have this feeling every now and then that someday HR is just going to walk through the door, and they're going to be like, "What are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how did you trick us for so long?" <laughs> um, so, imposter syndrome is a thing, right? So sometimes um, we kind of overinflate imposter syndrome, but it is an honest to God thing, right? There's a Wikipedia page on it and you know, <laughs> there are mental health professionals who have studied it. So it's an honest to God thing. Um, and learning how to deal with that. So you can mitigate that stomach ache as much as possible. That's a thing. Um, and this is another reason for trumpeting your wins. Um, it, it, and so I've done various things over the years. I used to have a personal Kanban board when I was actually in an office. I've worked home office and remote now for years and years. Um, but, you know, having a board that you can look at when you're feeling that gut ache of, man, I am a fraud and this house of cards is going to fall down. And you turn around, it's like, wait a minute, you know, look. Last week, I solved this problem. I helped this person um, journaling or actually writing things down. I don't mean like in notepad or one note, but an actual physical book because there's psychology science behind the act of physically writing something out as well, right? I mean, I've got 90,000 moleskins around, of course, none within arm's reach, but um, 
all write that stuff down in a book. Um, and it helps me better deal with that imposter syndrome. It also reminds me when I'm having a struggle, wait a minute, you know, maybe didn't I have the same kind of problem last year and, you know, I can go back. Um, we do ourselves a disservice, and I say this as somebody who still struggles with this, we do ourselves a disservice as awesome humans when we let that imposter syndrome get so much control over our life. We are nowhere near as bad as we think we are, right? You're absolutely right, and it's hard to it's hard to see that. I know I've um, I, I was mentoring someone who wanted to become a project manager, and um, they were from the development background. And I said, you know, I really want to be a project manager, but I just don't. I'm just not a project manager. So uh, we sent them to Scrum Master training. They came back, they passed, got their Scrum Master certification. Now they're technically still a developer, still working, you know, on software. And um, I, I was like, well, why don't you try to run this project? Well, I'm not a project manager. I'm like, well. No author was ever an author until they wrote a book. You know, <laughs> you, you can't you can't have that mindset of that you're not something. You know, and, until you try it, you've got to right. you got to try it first. Um, and I said you weren't a developer either until you got a job as a developer. <laughs> so, um, and you know that's that is the most fulfilling thing for me as a leader is not seeing. Oh, we finished this project on time and under budget. Uh, we're actually ahead of time, and the customers are raving about it. You know, it's solving problems. All of that's really good, right? But when I can help somebody take a step um, that they may have been hesitant about, um, or when I can help them get out of a pit, um, that is the most rewarding thing for me ever. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, whether it's stepping into a new role that they don't feel comfortable about, right? Going and in, diving into the PM stuff. Or some years ago, I had a guy on a team who was, uh, he was a good human, but his technical skills were just awful. And he was, uh, it was pretty much mocked by the rest of the team. Um, and over the period of months and a whole lot of really uncomfortable, hard discussions, um, he changed the course of his skill. He got more fired up about learning stuff. And a few years later, um, <laughs> uh, two guys that used to mock and deride this guy constantly were talking about what a big asset he was to the team. I'd, sent, I'd, I'd long since moved on, right? And this was not me um, fixing him. Rather, this was me helping him discover what he needed to do himself. And then he ran with it. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good distinction that you meant that you mentioned there is that he had to do this himself. Um, right. It took a mentor to help bring that out to show him what he already had, but it's something he had to do himself. And I think sometimes when when you get put into management, you feel like it, it's more like you're trying to push someone instead of pull them. And I always try to use the analogy of, of a rope. You know, if you have a rope tied to a weight, you can't push that rope to move the weight. You have to pull it. You know, and. Uh, it, and I think that's that's part of what what you just mentioned there with leadership is that you had to pull that out of them. You couldn't just force it upon them. Exactly right. You know, uh, the only you know I had carrots. Um, <laughs> look, you know, you're uh, uh, you know this is not the right way for you to be a productive person. Um, and then there was a stick of you know at some point it's going to be time for you to go somewhere else. Um, but, you know, it's, it's like encouraging, um, having some empathy and some belief that, you know, 99% of all humans uh, want to do the right thing. They're just wrapped up either in a lot of fear um, or just FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt. Um, and then realizing, too, that um, in a lot of those situations, you might have some ideas, but you don't have all the answers. So you can't just say do X, Y, and Z. You know, it's like, well, why don't we try X and see how that goes? Is that working for you? No? Okay, then we'll try red. And if red doesn't work, then we'll try aardvark. Um, uh, yeah, leading people and managing people's hard. <laughs> yeah. So what would you say is your, the the, um, the most difficult thing when it comes to leadership that you've had to encounter? The, the, like the hardest person, the hardest environment or, or situation that you've had to kind of work through? 
Um, I've had I've had a few pretty spaces. Uh, when I was in the military, one of my underlings um, was on a hunting trip, and there was a firearms accident, and the guy he was hunting with uh, was shot. Oh! It turned out the guy he was hunting with was having an affair with the guy's wife. So and, accident or? <laughs> um. So for a year, this kid was under investigation, um, wasn't able to fly, wasn't able to do his primary job, had all this legal stuff going on, had mental health stuff, um, and having to deal with that was, that took a couple years off my life. Mm. Um, I had another issue where I was part of a team, but... Uh, didn't run anybody on the team, but I was the old guy on the team. And one of the people on the team had some pretty epic hygiene problems. Like, if you were within three feet of him, it was nausea-inducing. And everybody comes to me to try to get that straight. I'm like, what the hell? I don't even <laughs> speak the language. This was while I was living in Germany. Um, <laughs> uh, but... You know, had to work through that. So, so um, how, how do you approach that? Is that just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, or is it a? Yeah, yeah. It, um, it, it is absolutely. Uh, hey, um, pal, let's uh, let's go outside because I don't want to be in the same room as you in a little enclosed space. Um, and approaching it from as much grace and empathy as you can muster up. Um. Yeah, and then you know there was there was the guy with the technical skills, right? So, um, <clears throat> I also worked with a guy who was thrown off of a project because of his attitude. Um, had a very uh, abrupt, coarse personality. He was brilliant, um, really wanted to get things done well, but had awful people skills, um, and. Uh, you know, he he actually turned himself into somebody who uh, is now project lead, um, and and this is not right. I didn't have any magic Jim Holmes pixie dust. It was some hard conversations, um, understanding some resources for like. I'll always point to other books like the Trusted Advisor or Emotional Intelligence Two O, um, which are good kind of people skills things. Um, but yeah, I've had I've had a range of rather intense situations I've had to deal with. <laughs> yeah, I saw a talk that you gave. And that was one of the one of the things that really um, made me excited to have you on. Called "Makes You Stronger," where um, you talked about how you know going through something difficult can can strengthen you um, in ways that you, that you can't even imagine and, and think about. How has that happened, uh, or how have you been strengthened in, in the past by, by things you've had to encounter? Um, so, yeah, that talk was from Kalamazoo X uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago. And I'm going to link that up in the show notes so people can watch that um, as oh, well. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, so that particular talk was very open kimono, was very intense. Um Six or eight years ago, uh, I had a pretty significant um, struggle with depression to the point where I was suicidal. Um, and there were a number of things in my life that were contributing to that. Um, but I ended up having a no shit moment, um, got some professional help, which was crucial. Uh, got on some meds and worked through that. I think uh, I, I think uh, everybody needs to. Um, I don't want to say everybody because that's always it's always the wrong thing whenever you include everybody and everything. But I think regular professional help maintenance is is, is helpful. You know, we don't talk enough about mental health. We it's don't. A, You're absolutely hard, right. It's a hard, scary thing. There's a lot of stigma mm -hmm. around it. We're getting better, particularly in the IT sector. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but, but like I, I know like where I work, they give you um, – there, there's an EAP program, and, and part of that is uh, that you're allowed like three sessions or six sessions a year uh, to talk to someone. And I, I think everyone should use every one of those. Um, even if you don't – even if you're not – feeling depressed or suffering depressed even if you have nothing you know you're not cheating on your wife you have nothing bad going on i think you should still you know j- just to get that checkup you know like like you go to the doctor to get checked up i think sometimes you you got to get your your your, your well well being taken care of as well and i hate the fact that there's a stigma around getting help because it, it is everybody needs it in my opinion it's crucial because those those types of sessions and, and you hit upon it so well right um Rather than being retroactive, if you're proactive, work with a mental health professional will give you a set of tools that can help you when things do go bad. Right. So, you know, I was in a bad spot, um, but got got some really good tools, both, you know, drugs, um, but then things to... Um, think about things, you know, ways to look at life, little practices. I mean, everything from some meditation skills to like how to break something apart, how to communicate. Um, and the thing was that coming out of the, that getting that foundation of the tools, recognizing that it was depressed, that it did have some errors, got through all of that bad spot. Um, and that gave me strength then for when my life went really bad a year and a half ago when my son murdered my wife, um, which, uh, yeah, 12 year old kid. Um, and you know, uh, I could not have gotten through this last year and a half. I mean, for a whole lot of reasons. Right. But, um, the earlier episode gave me a foundation and tools to be able to deal with when things really went off the rails. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, that that talk makes you stronger. Um, I rant on how we've become averse to adversity um, in discussions, in dialogue, in discomfort. But the thing is, you know, there's that old adage, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger because you learn how to deal with that adversity and life, life is pain and suffering alongside of all of this joy and grace from the universe and from other people, right? But if you, if you don't learn those tools and learn how to deal with things that are bad, how are you going to live? I mean, seriously, right? Um, you know, uh, I am sober. I'm alive. Um, I'm getting through things because of all of those struggles I've had through my life and learn how to deal with them, right? Um, yeah, you can't just duck and run from everything. Learn how to deal with it, and it makes you a better person. You know, I think you're absolutely right, and I think it's a, um, it's a powerful message that you, you're you bringing out that a lot of people just, you know, it, it's unfortunate that maybe they haven't had a rough patch before they hit the really big rough patch to get them ready for it, you know? And, and I, I know you never want to say, I'm thankful that I went through something like that. But in hindsight, sometimes you needed to go through something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm here to take care of my daughter uh, and my son, who's institutionalized at the moment, because of what I'd gone through earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, does it make me a better person? I don't, <laughs> I can't say that, right? But I, what I can say is that, you know, those rough patches let me get through now and do what I need to. Right. Uh, And, you know, you can look, uh, you know, uh, hopefully not everybody goes through what I've gone through, but you can take that in a different aspect. And, you know, looking back at what you asked, you know, what are the difficult uh, situations you dealt with at work? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, because I'd had those hard conversations, um, because I'd had those hard situations, um, it is now easier for me to get into harder discussions uh, that other folks might avoid either in the team room or one-on-one or with a client, right, or with my own leadership. 
Mm-hmm. Um, because you can sit back and say, I've been through this before. I got this, right? And that whole imposter syndrome thing, you know, when you can look back to, wait a minute, I did X, Y, and Z. I got this. I can do it. I have been through this before. I've been tempered in the fire. Um, and I know I can get through this. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Some people will say, well, I like you've been there. You can actually say, well, I've, I have been there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it makes you, uh, it makes those conversations a little bit easier. I, I'll never forget the first time I get, I, I was in a, I participated in, you know, being the leader, the manager, having a one-on-one. I was terrified, you know, but I kept saying in my, in my mind, they're just as nervous as I am. They're just as nervous as I am. Yeah. <laughs> but then after I've done, you know, a dozen or two of these, it's like, oh, this is just another one-on-one. And now it's, I'm comfortable with it. And I'm actually looking forward to having these uh, from time to time. So it's not like it's uh, something that's terrifying anymore because you've been right. there. You've been there and you've <laughs> seen the positive stuff that can come out of what might otherwise be an uncomfortable situation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, yeah, we, we put in about an hour. I want to be cognizant of your time. Um, is there anything else that you want to leave us with about leadership and, and what we can do to help make us a, a stronger leader as we go through this journey of leadership? Um, so a couple things, first off, kind of the narcissistic self promoting thing. Um, the books on lean pub, uh, I think the all of the feedback I've had have been has been really good. Um, I also do uh, consulting on the side, workshops on the side. So if somebody's looking for some practical help, I can do that. All right. So that's kind of like the narcissistic self promotion. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to link up your uh, your blog, your book, and uh, oh, and your Twitter handle all in the okay. show notes. It's going to be at a geekleader.com slash Jim Holmes. Um, so it'll all be linked up there for as long as this site's around, <laughs> which well, hopefully will be forever. <laughs> so, um, more generally, um, think about those people skills like we do our tech skills, right? They are they don't magically appear. You need to work at them. You need to um, you need to go out. And you need to learn. You need to screw some things up epically. I mean, we didn't even get into my numerous leadership epic fails, right? You know, I am not some magic unicorn that farts pixie dust and, you know, everything just greatly happens, right? I've screwed some things up um, (laughs) that I will carry to my grave. Um, But don't be afraid of it, right? Um, uh, And looking, wanting more responsibility, wanting to help others is not like this narcissistic, brown nosing thing right it is an act of service um even if you don't feel you can be good at it frankly if you don't feel good at it go do it because that's a self-check but you know leadership comes in many different forms i I talk about having like done stuff from leading a cub scout pack to highly competitive volleyball teams to all kinds of other things right um Giving back, helping others grow, mentoring, um, leading others is extraordinarily rewarding. Um, and uh, look at it as a challenge. I mean, take it on, jump in. Um, you know, just remember the other people are humans. Approach everything from a from empathy and grace as much as you can. Um, yeah. So that's that. <laughs> Well, that's good. I really appreciate having you on. And uh, uh, where can people find out more about you or link up to you and get your book? Um, so probably the easiest place. I mean, it, my blog is very easy to remember. Frazzleddad.com. You've heard me talk about some parenting things. So, yeah, Frazzled Dad, if you remember that, that'll get you to my blog, which has links to the book. Um, I'm on Twitter as A. Jim Holmes. Not the Jim Holmes, just A. Jim Holmes. <laughs> Um, and yeah, that's probably the easiest way to find me to get in touch with. And, um, you know, so I talked about consulting and workshops, blah, 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 but, uh, I'm also happy to just have conversations with folks. Um, so if you got questions, just, you know, drop me something on Twitter, find my email for my blog. Um, drop me a note. Love to chat. Thanks so much. I appreciate you being on. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. 